ثواب الفاتحة بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم صلوا على محمد وآل محمد الله صل على أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين خاتم النبيين سيد الممجد بشير المصدق المصطفى الأمجد محمود الأحمد أبي القاسم محمد الله صل على محمد وعلى وعلى أهل بيته طيبين الطاهرين المعصومين ولعن الله على الظالمين من الأولين والآخرين أما بعد فقال الله سبحانه وتعالى في كتابه المجيد وفرقانه الحميد بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم سيقولون ثلاثة رابعهم كلبهم ويقولون خمسة سادسهم كلبهم رجما بالغيب ويقولون سبعة وثامنهم كلبهم قل ربي أعلم بعدتهم ما يعلمهم إلا قليل فلا تمار فيهم إلا مراء ذا ظاهرا ولا تستفتي فيهم منهم أحدا صلوات الله صلى الله عليه وسلم Mami Zamana, my respected elders, brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum jami'am wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. The verse that we have been quoting each night at the beginning of our majlis comes to us from the 18th chapter of the Holy Quran, Surah Al Kahf, verse number 22, in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala discusses the number of people and the, and the actual dog that is in the story of Surah Al Kahf. And he puts forward that some people suggest that it is a certain number. Maybe there are three and a fourth is the dog. Or maybe there are five and the sixth is the dog. Or maybe there were six and the seventh is the dog. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then concludes the point of the verse by saying that this issue is not the important issue. Although yes, there is a defined number and there are a certain group of people who know the exact number. What is important is not the number of people in the cave nor whether there was the dog with them. Rather, the important issue is the message that you should take from the story of Ashab al-Kahf. If you understood that they are going because they are seeking the opportunity to complete Tawheed, they are seeking the opportunity to continue worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and staying away from polytheism and the struggles that they put into this story, then you will have extracted the message from it rather than worrying about the nitty-gritty detail which ultimately does not affect you in your understanding of the story. And we utilize this on the first night in the introductory lecture by explaining that this point needs to also be replicated with the story of Karbala. In that too many times and too often we become embo- embroiled and embattled in small discussions that do not change the story of Karbala. Rather we should look at the messages of Karbala in order to appreciate why our Imam, his family members and his companions died and how the family members and companions also were taken in captivity thereafter. In such, we can appreciate that the whole story has many many lessons and therefore in order to exemplify the value of this verse we chose the story or to look at just the night of Ashura and we chose this maybe 12 hour period, this window, this gap in history whereby from the time in which the Imam والسلام, requires and requests the additional night for worship, for servitude, for the opportunity to be in presence before his Lord, his Creator and Sustainer until the time in which they actually go out to the battlefield. And we managed to extract Alhamdulillah Ta'ala nine very basic and simple lessons from them for example, the reasons as to why the Imam wanted the extra night was so that he could perform his salah, so that he could recite Quran, so that he could maximize his time. We also found that conversations during the night 
were the opportunity to or created the opportunity for us to extract deeper lessons of the night itself ultimately when we look at the whole story therefore if one night can provide us with so many lessons so can the whole of the event of Karbala so many lessons can be extracted from this period of time this great period in history whether it be from the time in which they asked for the allegiance or demanded the allegiance from the imam until they ta- until the time in which they returned back to the city of Medina again and therefore this provides us with so many lessons be it the lessons about obeying your imam the lessons of amr bin ma'ruf or nahi and al munkar be it the lessons of love for ahl al bayt hatred for the enemies of ahl al bayt Whatever the story may be, the value of Salah on the day of Ashura, the value of Hijab from the night of Ashura or from the night of Shama Gariba onwards, all of these stories come together in one universal message about the state of humanity and our role towards what we should be doing towards ensuring humanity goes forward. And therefore, it is important that we go back to one of the points of the Imam himself, whereby when he leaves the city of Medina he provides an everlasting wasiyah a testamentary will to his brother Muhammad al Hanafiya. he says to his brother inni lam akhruj ashiran wala batiran wala mufsidan wala zalima wa innama kharajtu li talab al islah fi ummati jaddi Muhammadin sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam Allahum salli ala uridu an amara bil ma'roof وأنها عن المنكر وأسير بسيرة جد محمد وأسير أبي علي ابن أبي طالب. His mission is encapsulated into one statement. He says, I am not rising because I am doing this out of fame, nor out of arrogance, nor am I rising because I seek to create mischief in the community, nor because I am an oppressive person. My one goal is to create Islah, reform in the community, in the nation of my grandfather Muhammad. May God's peace and blessings be upon him and his family. We highlighted that there are so many lessons from Karbala. From the time in which the family left Medina to the time in which they returned. And therefore the Imam is putting forward his whole mission based on ensuring that there is reformation. Now I want to propose a scenario to you. I want you to appreciate what we as the lovers of the Imam would react in this particular scenario. In order to really bring to life this word Islah, if we have stated that the Imam's movement, his death, the tragedies, the tears, the ma'atam, everything is based, is predicated on this term Islah, Therefore, what value needs to come from this from ourselves? I want you to imagine now that the Imam والسلام, is granted one day in which to raise from the grave. Just imagine. Of course, there's no literal belief in this. You know, Raj'ah is a different concept. But the Imam on his own, the third Imam, is granted one day to be risen from the grave in order to visit his Shia. And he leaves Karbala and he decides to come here. And as he's coming here, we are informed that Aba Abdullah himself, the Imam, is coming here to this Imam Bargha to visit us, this community. The first thing that would happen is it would spread like wildfire. There wouldn't be an empty seat in the house. The youths would come, the elders would come, the brothers would come, the sisters would come. They would clamber for car parking space just to be close. And we would come early and we would probably dress in our finest clothes. Or at least in the black clothes to present ourselves in front of the imam. To show my grief for him. And we'd sit waiting with bated breath for our imam to come. Wondering what oceans of knowledge what levels of treasures he would give to us. And so, we're all sitting and we're waiting. And the master of the martyrs enters. And he comes and he walks through these doors. And all of us stand up out of reverence. We bow our heads in shame of who we are. 
we try to look at his face and his face is glowing with nur. We want to come and grab his hand to kiss his hand and maybe throw ourselves underneath his feet so that we could just have the intercession from the dust underneath his feet. And he walks and we all part. And he comes and he takes the mimbar. And he begins to extol Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He gives praise to him. And then he gives salutations to the Holy Prophet of Islam and to his father and to his mother and to his brother. And now he comes to deliver a sermon. And he sits. What would he say? He would say that indeed, just as though there is corruption in the 61st year of Hijrah, there is corruption today. Just as though there was Yazid, there are many more Yazids today. Just as though there was Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad, there are many more Ubaidullah ibn Ziyads today. Just as though there was Umar ibn Sa'ad, who was the leader of the armies who were oppressing, there are many Umar ibn Sa'ads today. And therefore, I again want to go to war. Scenario. I'm posing a scenario. Again, I want to go to war. We want to go to war with the Yazids of today. And we want to go to war with the Umar ibn Sa'ads of today. And the whole of the community is sitting here. Who, which person would not stand up and give allegiance to Abu Abdullah? Which youth would not say, take the toys from my room. I have a Scrabble game. Take it, we will sell it in order to raise funds so we can have this challenge against evil. Which elder of the community would not say, I have been saving in order to give as an inheritance for my family. But here, take it because I want to come and fight in order of your way. Which person would not give everything for the sake of Abba Abdullah? The interesting thing is, Although we all know, and in no doubt we admit that there would not be a single one of us here that would not give everything in the way of Abba Abdullah, he is not asking for that. He is not asking for us to give that in his way. There are many Yazids of today, and there are many Umar ibn Sa'adins of today, but there are as many of us more indeed out there available to fight against the Yazids of today. The same way that there was corruption then, there is corruption today. But the same way there was goodness then, there is also goodness today. And the Imam is not asking for this. He's not asking for us to raise the sword. He's not asking us for us to go forward into the battlefield like he asked his companions. He's asking for one thing and one thing only. And that was Islah. Reformation. He did not ask for anything else. And if he was sitting on this member, I would dare say that he would again reiterate his statement. Inni lam akhruj ashiran wala batiran wala mufsidan wala zalima wa inna ma kharajtu li talab al-islah fi ummati jaddi Muhammad. I have not risen because I seek fame. I am already Aba Abdullah. I am not rising because I am arrogant. I am Sayyidai Shababi Ahlul Jannah. What the heavens have already given me is nothing compared to what the earth can give me. I'm not rising because I'm creating mischief in the community. There is already mischief in the community. I am trying to end the mischief. And I'm not rising because I'm an oppressor. No, I am rising so I can bring about reformation in the community of my grandfather Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. That's what he wants from us. That one single goal, that is what he wants from us. And therefore, for many people in the community, for many, many people in the community, now that the twelfth night of Muharram has come, everything has finished. Muharram is coming, Muharram will go. Ashura has approached, Sham Gharibah has passed, it is finishing. For many people, the twelfth night of Muharram signifies the end of the story. Whereas in your hearts and in your minds, brothers and sisters, from tonight, the story should just be beginning. You know, in other communities around the world, they say that the beginning of the new year is the chance to have your New Year's resolutions. That what happens, the first of January comes and you want to give up something. Maybe I will give up 
smoking. Maybe I will become healthier. Maybe I will start reading more. Whatever it may be. The Imam is giving us that opportunity similarly from the beginning of the new year. He is saying to us, I want this reformation from you. Whatever it is that I can have, I can see, I can tangibly observe that from this year, this moment in time, until Muharram again, 1433, in one year's time, I want to see, I want to observe reformation, improvement in you. You are at this point in your life. Your salah is this good. Your knowledge of Quran is this good. Your akhlaq is this good. I want it to tangibly move to being this good within the next 12 months. That's when I know my mission has been a success. That's when I know you have not only understood but applied my mission into your life. Otherwise, there was nothing for me to die for. Because my goal was reformation. And unless reformation takes place, why did I die? Sallallahu alayhi wa Muhammad wa alayhi Muhammad. And therefore, my dear respected brothers and sisters, as much as for my own heart, I would like to present maybe three very simple stages in which we can make this reformation. No matter what age, no matter what level of spirituality, no matter what level of knowledge, these three principles are universal principles. The scholars of the highest spiritual order also recommend these three principles in all of their books when they mention the movements, when they mention spiritual reformation, when they mention progress from point A to point B. And therefore we would like to present these to you as well. The first one is in regards to knowledge of where I stand in my actions. When it comes to understanding where I stand in actions, I mention just a few points in example. If I am here in my salah, and I am here in my Quran, and I am here in my akhlaq, I need to have knowledge of where I stand. You see, although we have been blessed with many speakers and madrasas and many books, some of us still need to ensure that the fundamentals are absolutely correct. Be it the performance of my wudu, the performance of my salah, be it the very basis of my recitation of Quran, these are the basics of where we need to move to. And therefore understanding where I am today in my own personal spirituality has to be the starting point of my goal for progression, my goal for reformation. We have all heard the statement, don't run before you can walk. Why is this not applied into our own spirituality? And maybe if I just have a bit of observation as to where I am in my own day-to-day -day actions, what is it that I talk about? What is it that I look at? What is it that I hear? The very basics of my day-to-day -day actions, then maybe I can begin to move forward. There is an interesting incident that took place. I dare say that we have all heard of the grand scholar Ayatollah al um, uh Muhammad Taqi Bahjat. May Allah bless his soul. Ayatollah al-Bahjat is narrated to have been or said to have been probably the lead spiritual master of our time and of our age. There are very few people who are said to have ever been on his level or even be able to understand the kind of level that Ayatollah al adama Muhammad Taqi Bahjat was on. He passed away only several more months ago. And indeed, the world mourned his passing. The tradition says that when a scholar, an alim dies, that the heavens and the earth mourns for 40 consecutive years. Imagine someone of Ayatollah Bahjat's knowledge and spirituality. I don't feel it's necessary to go forward and mention what he was like as a spiritual master. If you can imagine what it was like speaking with him, gathering his spiritual knowledge and trying to apply it. It is said one day that one of his very, very close students, not an ordinary student, a very close student, someone who had the blessings of every day working, studying with Ayatollah Bahjat, walked with him. And you often find that when you go to the Hawza al Miya, when you go to the Islamic seminaries in Qom and in Mashhad, in Tehran, that although you find that they are very grand and lovely universities, you often find that there are some very nice gardens, either situated very close 
or maybe just further. And Ayatollah Bahjit was one day walking in one of these gardens with this very great student of his. The student narrates that I wanted to take advantage of this one-to-one -one time with Ayatollah Bahjit. You know, there are always students around him, always, you know, people on Ziyara. I've seen videos of Ayatollah Bahjit when he's performing Salah. The Mu'mineen come and wipe their hand upon his back. You know, like we come to Dari and we wipe the hand hoping for Wasila intercession. And they come and they wipe the back of Ayatollah Bahjit hoping for intercession. Can you imagine the level of this man? So he says that I was walking alone with Ayatollah Bahjit and I wanted to take advantage of this one-to-one -one time. So I thought of the most difficult and long question or question that would decipher the most long amount of answer just so I could hear more and more treasures from Ayatollah Bahjit. Imagine. I, I wanted to find a question that would keep him talking. You know, someone who has com immediate, you know, immense knowledge. So what does the, uh, the student ask? He says, Sheikh, I would like you to tell me how we can become closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What a question. What a question. How, how l much of a link does it have to our discussion? Let us begin to commence by asking, where am I in my life? What is good? What is bad? Where am I strong? Where am I weak? And so he asks him, how can we become closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Imagine the knowledge of Ayatollah Bahjir, what he can take, which verses of Quran, how much depth he can go to, which stories he can take. You know what he said? Oh my dear student, in order to know how to become close to Allah, Know how distant you are from him in the first place. That's it. Just know what ocean lies between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Know what it is that is stopping me from getting closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Is it that whenever I'm with my friends, I always end up talking unnecessarily about such and such a thing? Is it when I come home and I turn on the TV, eventually I come towards such and such a channel? Or is it that when I'm alone and I'm actually sitting and there's no one else observing me other than Allah, I forget that He is watching me? Is it that I can't help but look at such and such a person when I'm at school or when I'm at work? Know the distance between you and Allah. Then you'll be able to bring yourself closer towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Stage one. Just have cognizance of where you actually are in your own day-to-day -day life. Stage one. Stage two. Stage two now goes a little bit further because it requires not only just taking this little bit of observance, observation upon myself, it now requires me to take this and become a little better with it. You see, when we take this concept of knowing where I am, it can be very simple. Okay, I am distant between myself and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because I end up talking about such and such a thing or because I can't help but looking at such and such a person. And this begins to tumble me. You know, I fall down the rocks very quickly because of this one action. But action two suggests that we go a step further into it. And this is actually reflection upon it. It's different. I can write, I can memorize, I can know something. But to ponder is completely different. To actually ponder upon myself and upon my action takes me to a greater level of depth. You see, when we begin to ponder, there is no boundary. There is no limit as to what I can ponder on. As an example, very simple questions. Very simple questions. Ask these questions to yourself if you have never asked them. What defines me? What defines me? Reflecting upon the self. Do these clothes that I wear define me? Because I come in these clothes and I also come out of these clothes, do I not? There's times when I go to work and I'm in my favorite three-piece suit. And there's times when I'm with the friends and I'm in jeans and a jumper. And there's times when I'm on the mimbar and I'm in the jubba. And there's times when I go for ad'iyat and I recite my abba and I wear my abba. Do these four different types of clothes define who I am? How am I observed by my mother and my father? How am I observed by my friends? 
How do the ulama see me when they see me? How does the imam of my time see me? If I know spiritually that the action that I perform cause different face, faces to call upon me, sometimes I can be viewed as a pig or as a cow or as a donkey or as a human being or as an angel. What face do I show when I'm with my mother? What face do I show when I'm with my friends? What face does the Imam of my time see upon me when he observes me? Begin to ask, does my job define me? Does my career define me? Does my knowledge define me? Does my akhlaq define me? Who am I and where am I going? You know, in spirituality, there's a concept about colors. Colors are a similar understanding to the face. Uh, I can be seen as a donkey or as a monkey, whatever it might be. The colors also define me. The closer to black, the darker my heart is. The closer to white, the more nur is within my heart. If I was a color, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was to make me a color, what color would I be? Pondering upon the self. You see, pondering is mentioned so many times within the Qur'an. أَفَلَا يَتَدَبَّرُونَ Quran. Do they reflect upon the Qur'an or are their hearts locked? One of the verses asks. Do we actually take time to ponder upon our actions and upon ourselves? There's one particular tradition that says, أَفْضَلُ الْعِبَادَةِ تَفَكَّرُ فِي اللَّهِ That the very best action one can perform the single best action one can perform is tafakkur, is deep levels of pondering for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There's an interesting tradition, and maybe you've heard this um, about the value of performing tadabbur, that there's different kinds of rewards. Have you ever come across the tradition that says to reflect for one hour, you get the equivalent of one year's worth of worship? Have you come across this? Another one says to reflect for one hour, you get seven years worth of ibadah as a reward. And there's another tradition that says that if you reflect for one hour, you get 70 years worth of reward. Have you come across these three traditions? There's an interesting one in which one of the companions of Rasulullah Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he comes to the Holy Prophet of Islam and he says, Ya Rasulullah, I have a question for you. I'm completely dumbfounded. I have heard that to ponder for one hour is the equivalent to one year's worth of ibadah. Rasulullah said, yes, that's correct. I have said this. He says, but I've also heard that you have said to reflect for one hour is the equivalent to seven years worth of ibadah. Rasulullah says, yes, I've said this as well. He said, but I've also heard that to ponder for one hour is the equivalent of 70 years worth of ibadah. He says, yes, I've said this as well. He says, this is my problem. I'm really confused. You have said that the action for one hour is the equivalent to three different kinds of rewards. Can you explain to me how one action can have three levels of reward? He says, no problem. Come with me. He goes to the first companion. And he says, what have you heard from me? Ya Rasulullah, peace be upon you. I have heard from your mouth that to... Ponder for one hour is the equivalent to one year's worth of worship. He says to the companion, he says, why is this? Say, Ya Rasulullah, the reason as to why this is, is because we reflect upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Rasulullah turns to the first companion, the one who asks him the question. He says, this is right. When you reflect upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for one hour, it is the equivalent to one year's worth of ibadah. Come, let's go to the second companion. So he takes the questioner, he takes him to the second companion. He says, Assalamu alaikum, alaikum salam, ya Rasulullah. What have you heard from me in regards to reflection? He says, in regards to reflection, ya Rasulullah, I heard from you that to, for one hour is the equivalent of seven years worth of worship. Why? He says, because you reflect upon death. What happens at the time of death? What happens in barzakh? What happens in the hereafter? Rasulullah turns to the question and said, see, one hour's worth of reflection, when this kind of reflection is performed, that's the equivalent to seven years' worth of ibadah. Come, let's go to the third companion. And he takes him towards the third companion. Salaamu alaikum, alaikum salam, ya Rasulullah. He says, what have you heard from me in regards to reflection? 
Ya Rasulullah, I have heard that one hour of reflection is the equivalent to 70 years worth of ibadah. Rasulullah says, why have I said this? He said, it's because you reflect upon your role in society. How it is that you are letting society down and how you can improve yourself towards helping society reach a higher station. Rasulullah says to the questioner, that's why you get 70 years worth of ibadah. Because when you don't look at yourself as an individual, but you begin to understand what you can do to take your level of reflection into action for the benefit of everyone around you. That's why you get 1 to 70. There was a scholar who actually put an addendum, he put an addition to this, to this point on the hadith. He said, why 70? Okay, one hour is equivalent to one. One hour is equivalent to seven. Why is one hour's worth of reflection equivalent to 70 years worth of ibadah? He says to understand this, you need to have it explained by another tradition of Rasulullah. Rasulullah is narrated to have said, my community lives to the average age of between 60 and 70 years old. Therefore, if you say 70 years is how long I'm going to live, it's this reward. Because it makes you realize that one hour worth of reflection can change your whole life. It is the equivalent of having changed your entire life. So that when you die at 70 years, your whole life has been changed. That's why the equivalent from one hour to 70 years worth of worship. One hour's worth of reflection can change my whole life. So that 70 years when I die, when my soul is taken back, it has been a worthwhile life for me before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Reflection, complete pondering. And therefore, as we stated, when I reflect that yes, my eye always gets caught towards such and such. Or that what I'm talking about always happens to fall down when I'm with such and such. It's no longer just recognizing that's the problem. It's actually reflecting upon the depth of it. In what circumstance do I speak illegitimately? In what circumstance do I look at? Is it certain types of friends that when I'm with them, that's when I speak illegitimate. But when I'm with other kinds of friends, I speak good deeds. When I'm with certain kinds of friends, I end up going to such and such a house or to such and such a place. That's why I need to make sure I don't stand with them anymore. But when I'm with such and such a friend, I do good. We go to the mosque, we go and sit together, we talk together, we go to the, to the mall, but we only talk good towards each other. Whatever it may be, now it becomes reflection of upon the action. This is why I go towards the bad and this is why I go towards the good and therefore I now actually know what I need to do to ensure that I no longer to go towards the bad. There's one thing knowing the distance but there's another thing actually putting a plan in place through that reflection and therefore this is where we need to come to. The second stage, actually deciphering a very clear goal, a clear path. I know now what causes me harm and what causes me good. I will now separate myself from the haram towards the good. Stage two. Stage three. Remember, these are all simple stages. Very simple stages. No one, a child could have understood these stages. But it's the knowledge in application that makes a difference to our life. And therefore, stage three is now taking this level of reflection to a whole new level. And this level is about taking self-account of ourselves at all times. Self-account at all times. You see, it's interesting. We know that there is going to be a day of accounting. And therefore, we appreciate there will be one time when I will have to present my book of deeds before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And He will judge me. And He will say, you did this and you did that. Why did you do this and why did you do that? But the problem is, at that point it will be too late. Time will have gone and at that point judgment will come and either I'm going here or I'm going there. The question is, if I know that this self-accounting causes regret, if I know taking the time out to actually reflect upon my day will cause regret, the question is why do I not do it during my own day? Why is it that I don't take self-accounting at the end of every day to ensure that I am improve, improving myself? You find that there are scholars of spirituality that say the end of every day must, look at the words, the end of every day must include self-accounting. Sit on the bed, put the pillow up, prop yourself up, or sit on the musalla 
and take five minutes to just go through the day. When I woke up, did I wake up on time for Fajr? Or did I wake up late for Fajr? When I came downstairs and I saw the wife or the child or my dad and my mom, did I greet them or did I not greet them? Did I get angry with them in the morning and did I leave the house angry? Why did we fight? Did I leave the house having kissed my daughter goodbye this morning? When I got to work, the first thing I did was look at such and such a person. Or the first thing I did was to thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for having a job during such a difficult economic time. When I came home, did I pray my Salat al-Maghrib and Isha on time? Or did I decide to watch a couple of hours of TV, uh, relax myself and then go watch, and then go recite Salat al-Maghrib and Isha? Self-accounting of the day. Because when you get to this point, you begin to appreciate yourself as yourself. You begin to write a column, good, bad, positive, negative, beautiful, ugly. These are the list of things that I've done. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. The good completely outweighs the bad. Or, na'udhu billah, my bad outweighs my good. And therefore I have taken account of what I'm going to do. Tomorrow I make the oath to my own self that although I looked at such and such a person in the office, tomorrow I won't do it. I make the oath that yesterday, because I was unable to pray my dhuhr on time, I went there half an hour later. I ate first my lunch before I went for dhuhr. I could have recited my dhuhr and then have eaten. Tomorrow I will make sure I do this better. Or even better so, I did recite my dhuhr on time. It was bang on 12 o'clock and therefore tomorrow I'm going to make sure I do it again. You see, self-accounting completely throws a different light upon the self you begin to appreciate the value of one's own actions. Allama tabatabai, may Allah bless his soul. Allama tabatabai. He says, there has not been a single day in which I performed the action of self-accounting at night in which a new veil was not lifted between myself and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allama. Imagine what he was seeing. Imagine which spiritual disclosures were being opened to him. There was not a single night in which I performed this, except veils were being lifted between myself and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Think this is a new concept? Think this is something that has been introduced by the ulama? No. There is a companion by the name of Adi. Adi was one of the closest companions of the commander of the faithful. It is narrated three of his sons went to the battle of Sifin, and were all martyred in front of the commander of the faithful. Amir al-Mu'mineen was slaughtered, he was martyred. And therefore Muawiyah called Adi to him in his palace and in front of his court. He said, Adi, come, I want to ask you about your relationship with your imam. So Adi comes and he stands before Muawiyah. Muawiyah tries to play a little bit of a trick. He tries to make Adi blame Ali ibn Abi Talib for the death of his sons in Safin. He says, Adi, tell me, don't you feel bad that your three sons died? He says, why would I feel bad? They were martyred for Ali ibn Abi Talib. I am delighted that they have been martyred. So Muawiyah tries a different angle. He says, aren't you sad at least that they have died and you are still alive? Listen to his response. I am sad. Muawiyah. But I am sad that Ali ibn Abi Talib is dead whilst I am alive. I wish I had flung myself in front of the sword of Ibn Muljim. Muawiyah realizes that he can't trick him. You know, you can't play with the true Shia of Ali ibn Abi Talib. You know what he does? Muawiyah says, fine. Tell me about your Imam. Why do you love him so much? Adi stands in front of him. He says, why I love Ali ibn Abi Talib so much? He says his face shone so much that it was difficult for his Shia to even look him directly in the face. His teeth were like rows of pearls, they shone. During the day, he was with us as if he was one of us. And at night, he would retire home to take account of himself. He would question as to which person he had harmed. He questioned as to which poor person he fed today. He questioned as to whether he performed oppression upon anyone. That's why I love Ali ibn Abi Talib so much. Imam, Caliph, Hujjah, 
Master, inherit of Rasul. At night he went home and took account of his own actions. Do you know what happened? Mu'awiyah, the tradition. And you can find this from the book of Shaheed Mutakhari. He says, Mu'awiyah began to weep at this. He began to cry having heard the, the, the attributes and the characteristics of Ali ibn Abi Talib. You know what he says? O oh, Adi, how do you feel about the separation of your Imam? He says, I swear to God, it hurts me more to be separated from Ali ibn Abi Talib than what it would do to have a mother's beheaded child in her lap. Can you imagine when you begin to love Ali ibn Abi Talib that you become to this level? And therefore, brothers and sisters, three very basic stages to ensuring islah, reformation of the self takes place. And therefore to ensure the victory of Aba Abdullah continues year after year after year. Number one, what is the distance between myself and my Lord? Number two, reflecting upon the actions. And number three, taking self-account so that tomorrow is better than today. I repeat what I stated at the beginning of the majlis. Tonight is the twelfth night of Muharram. And therefore for some people, this is the end. It has come and it has gone. The momentum, the movement, the sacrifice, the majalis, the crying, the matam, it has come and it has gone. But for some people the twelfth is not the end. It is just the beginning. Tonight is the clean slate. Tonight is the opportunity to make amends and move forward. Tonight is the night for the victory of Aba Abdullah. And therefore, respected brothers and sisters, just as for you and I, tonight is the beginning and not the end. For Sayyida Zainab and Sayyida Umm Kurthum, tonight was the beginning and was not the end. Because what they had to before and what befell upon them was so tragic was so tragic that Umm Kurthum says in one of her lines of poetry on this night, she says, I swear by Allah, if we, if this situation was had to have befallen upon anyone else, they would complain to all of existence for what has happened to them. Can you imagine this level of grief? Can you imagine when Sayyida Umm Kurthum describes what happens in this scenario? And therefore it is narrated on the night of the 11th, that eventually the children were pacified. They were running to the left and to the right. And they would come towards their aunties and towards their mothers. And they would say, where is my father? And where is my brother? Where is Abba Abdullah? And where is Abu Fadl al-Abbas? And they would all have to come and consile. And they would have to come and say to them that they are no longer, their bodies are left upon the plains of Karbala. It is narrated that after these few minutes, eventually Sayyida Zainab managed to get a few minutes of sleep. And in these few minutes of sleep, she was awoken by a rider coming to towards her. She says to the rider, O oh man, please do not come closer because we have managed just now to put the children to sleep and therefore we do not want you to come any closer. The man continues to gallop on his horse. Again Sayyida Zainab turns towards the man and calls out, O oh man, there is nothing left for you to plunder. They have taken our veils. They have taken our earrings. They have taken all of our things from us. Please do not come anymore. We have nothing for you to take from us. She again hears the man is continuing to gallop towards them. She tries another tactic. She turns towards the man galloping and she says, Oh man, I swear if you come any closer, I will complain to my father Ali ibn Abi Talib about your actions. The man continues to gallop. He reaches towards Sayyid Zainab. He he comes down from his horse. He says, Oh my dear daughter,
daughter Zainab. Do you not recognize your own father, Ali ibn Abi Talib? Sayyid Zainab falls towards the floor. She cries out, Father, why is it that you have come now but you did not come before? Did you see what they did to your son, Aba Abdullah? Did you see what happened to your beloved Abu Fadl al Abbas? Did you see my own Muhammad represent me on the day? He said to her, Yes, I did. I have been with you since the beginning, and I will be with you until the end. It is narrated that on this night they came and they took the bodies, and all of the bodies began to be lined up one by one, and the enemies took their swords. It is narrated that the first companion to have been beheaded on the tenth of the Muharram was Habib ibn Mudahir. And similarly, on the tenth of Muharram, Aba Abdullah was also beheaded. But the others were not beheaded at that time. Although their bodies were broken, although they were bludgeoned towards any kind of manner, but now their heads still remained. How did their heads become severed? It is narrated on this night they come, and they come and severed the heads of the lifeless bodies. They took the head of Ali and Al-Akbar. They took the head of Abu Fadl al-Abbas. They separated them from the shoulders. And therefore on this night, you find that Khuli took the head of Aba Abdullah. He took the head home with him. And as he brought it home, he also took the things in which he had snapped, snatched from the women and children of Ahl al-Bayt. He takes it towards his house and he hopes to get a great reward from Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad. He comes and he lays down inside the bed. He comes and his wife is lying there. She says, where have you been these last few days? He says, I have been in Karbala. We have managed to kill a group of oppressors and we have managed to kill a group of people who have risen against the Caliph. But now I am very tired. I am going to sleep. It is narrated that the wife of Khuli, she got a dream at this time. She got a dream and in her dream it was a lady dressed in black. She says, who are you? The lady dressed in black says, I am Fatima to Zahra. Oh, oh wife of Khuli, why is it that you have in your house my daughter's possessions? Why is it that you have in your house the very things that belong to my granddaughters? She wakes up and she wakes up Khuli. She says, Khuli, where were you? What happened in the fields of Karbala? Khuli says that we attacked an enemy. She says, I want to know who you attacked. He said to her, my wife, it was Hussein, the son of Fatima that was there. We killed them all and then we attacked the tents. We burned the tents and we took everything from them. What did you take? He says, I took this pair of earrings from one young daughter by the name of Sukaina. She says, what happened when you took the earrings? He said, I came towards her. The first thing is that I slapped her upon the face. Then she turned to me and said, oh enemy, if you want to take my earrings, you can take them. But I was impatient. I could not wait for her to take the earrings out. I snatched the earrings from her while she was wearing them. She bled upon the floor and and therefore I have these earrings underneath the bed. The wife got up and said, Oh enemy of Allah, how can I sit here in this? She said, What else did you do? She, he said to her oh, wife, I also have with me in possession, I have the head of Abu Abdullah. She said, Where is the head of Hussein? He said, I have put it in the oven in the kitchen. Can you imagine the head of Abu Abdullah being in your oven? She runs down she says that I saw at that time sitting next to the oven a woman the same one from my dream dressed in black she said oh wife of Khuli I am the mother of the one whose head is in this oven it does not end there because eventually the women and the children they were taken out of the plains of Karbala they were put into shackles the women and children were tied by one very large rope at the front of their 
him was Imam Zain al Abidin at 22 years old. He had his arms tied, he had his feet tied, and they put a metal yoke upon his neck. This metal yoke, it had spikes on it so that it embedded itself into his neck. I ask you, brothers and sisters, if you have ever been to the Middle Eastern countries when it is summer, how hot is it under the plains? How hot is it under the sun? Imagine this burning yoke onto the neck of Imam Zain al Abidin. Uh, Imam al Muhammad al Baqir was no older than four or five years old at this time. The children and the women were tied together. One narration says that as they were taken as captives, the women were placed on unsaddled camels. They were taken between 17 different cities to Kufa and then to Sham, paraded in front of all of the men. People were beating drums at celebrations. It is narrated that as they were taken, they were not taken around the dead bodies. No, they were taken between the dead bodies. They were made to observe the broken bodies of all of their children and all of their menfolk. They were weaved in and out from one body towards another body. At one point it is narrated that Sayyidah Zainab is sitting on the camel. As she comes towards the body of Abba Abdullah, she raises her head towards the sky and says, Oh Muhammad, let the salutations come to you from the angels of the heavens. Oh Muhammad, here lies the broken body of Hussein. His limbs are torn. Oh Muhammad, here lies your daughters. They are in captives and they are being taken away. Zainab, she falls towards the floor. She puts her hands underneath the body of Hussein. She tries to raise it towards the sky. She says, Ilahi, taqabbal minna hadha al-qurban. My Lord, accept this small sacrifice in your way. Please raise your hands and join me in dua. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the forgiveness of our sins. The sins of all those whom we love, all those that love us, our parents, our marhumin, our ulama, and our leaders. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the opportunity to understand the message of Karbala, Kufa, and Sham. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that just as the Imam states that his mission is Islah, reformation, that we can actualize this reformation and that we are the ones who Imam is proud of us and that next year we come to him with even more knowledge and ma'rafah of him. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the opportunity to perform the ziyarat of Aba Abdullah. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to curse the enemies of Ahl al-Bayt from the first to the last. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to not remove them from the hellfire and to let them suffer in humiliation. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for all the schools around the world, be you Muslim and non-Muslim, who are not aware of the movement of Karbala, the universal message of Karbala to become aware of it. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for all schools, be you Muslim and non-Muslim, that those people who uphold the evil leaders of Islam, the ones who usurp the rights of Ahlul Bayt alayhim salatu wassalam, that you make them aware of their crimes and turn them towards the path of Muhammad and Ali Muhammad. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we are part and parcel of that movement towards Muhammad and Ali Muhammad. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the opportunity to perform the ziyarat of the Imam of our time. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that as the thirst is overcoming us, as our soul is being taken from our body, and as the angels come to collect it, that it is Aba Abdullah that comes to our side at that time and that he quenches our thirst. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the opportunity to fight and to die in the love of Muhammad and Ali Muhammad. Wassalamu alaikum jami'an wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.